Anyway, um, today I'm going to be talking about one aspect of my research. I, I have a couple of them, so the, the students are spread out over a couple of areas. Um, you will have heard in the past from a number of my uh, colleagues about our microwave imaging research. I'm not going to be talking about microwave imaging today. Um, I have uh, other areas. But today we're going to be talking about positron emission tomography and, and how we are attempting to turn noise into numbers. Uh, and this is a follow-up of part two talk to one that I gave a number of years ago to this, well, not the same group, but BME at the time. The faces are very different now. Um, where I, I talked about some of our earlier work in CT, uh, where we were trying to do much the same sort of thing. And this has evolved uh, into, into work on positron emission tomography. And we're looking here as to how we can go about improving our functional imaging modality of PET, and also to use uh, the information we can gather uh, to give us anatomical images from a functional imaging modality. Just as an introduction, um, my, my goal really is to try to find ways of improving healthcare. Uh, it's always been a, a driving force behind what I've done. And, uh, when I left school, they told me I should go into medicine. I told them they were nuts. I had no interest in becoming a physician. I wanted to be an engineer. Uh, and that really involved becoming a physicist because I found that physics was perhaps more interesting than the engineering drawing was. Uh, and so I, I've sort of oscillated between the engineering fields where I worked for a number of years in industry and physics, uh, where I spent the last uh, 25 odd years uh, working. And you know, part of that goal of mine in improving healthcare is to train both medical physicists and biomedical engineers. Um, I'm looking at improved diagnostic and therapeutic tools, so both diagnostic imaging and imaging involved in therapy as well as other uh, therapeutic uh, developments. Um, and really we're looking at getting better quality images, both improving sensitivity and specificity, um, trying to find safer and more effective processes, and key to our microwave imaging work, as I'm not going to talk about that today, is greater access, trying to find ways of getting some of these imaging modalities to people who currently don't have access to them, either rural communities in Manitoba um, or in developing countries. But ultimately, I'm trying to turn noise, things that typically don't feel has any value, um, whether this be you know, uh, in, in the petting field or whether it actually is the people, uh, into some, some valuable numbers. Now, like a YouTube advertisement where, or YouTube video where you get that advertisement that's most frustrating in the beginning, I'm going to throw in a quick advertisement here um, for our medical physics program. Not that I'm expecting you suddenly to change and, and want to do medical physics, but just a outline and identify that there are a number of graduate level courses which we deliver as part of this program um, which are open to graduate students in general. So if there are areas where you would like to get a little bit of extra knowledge, whether it be in things like radiation biology uh, or the physics of some specific modality that impacts on the work that you're doing, uh, please feel free to contact me uh, and, and we can try to, to sign you up for some of these courses. They're not easy, uh, as any graduate course is not easy, but they are available. Right, our research in medical physics uh, covers a relatively wide area of, of work, um, and the two that I'm going to talk about to some degree this morning, this afternoon, is CT scatter imaging. I'm going to give you an update of where we started and some of the results, but I'm going to focus largely on PET scatter imaging. But we're also doing work on detector research, the microwave imaging that I already mentioned. We're doing work on portal dissymmetry, which is using high energy mega voltage uh, linear accelerators give us images which we can use to calculate dose with these patients while they're being treated. We're looking at trying to track organ motion, things of that nature while patients are undergoing treatment and trying to optimize the treatment delivery of patients. And so my research sort of touches on all of these, uh, but today we're going to stick with the, with the top two. And I'll start off with a statement generally that says that you know, all photons scatter. Some way or other they, they scatter, whether it be microwave imaging where we see lots of scattering taking place, uh, whether we see it in CT, uh, in positron emission tomography, or in mammography, we, we see some level of, of scattering taking place. And the generally accepted statement, the general assumption, is that these scattered photons are noise, and we should be ignoring them or trying to remove them at best. And I think our hypothesis here is that basically we disagree that in many cases these scattered photons carry useful information and the trick is really how we can try to extract that useful information and what we can do to 
to make these otherwise noisy bits of information valuable. And so I say my, my research focuses on how to harness the scattered radiation in order to improve image quality, uh, lower the dose, which is one of our key driving factors in most of our ionizing imaging uh, methodologies, uh, to improve diagnostic and therapeutic outcomes. That's really the goal of our research. So where do I come from? Well, I come from a background actually as a radiotherapy medical physicist um, with very little imaging uh, exposure at the time, although I did quite a bit of work in CT initially. Um, and in, in therapy, scatter plays a big role. It's really important to understand how scattered photons uh, propagate through the material uh, because this impacts our dose to the patient, and we need to understand that before we can do accurate dose calculations. And when we come into imaging, which is a more recent trend in radiotherapy, and we start to look at negative voltage portal imaging uh, that we do, or using cone beam CT, these modalities are also very prone and sensitive to scatter. And so, as a medical physicist, we have to ask ourselves, what is the scatter all about? How does it work? Uh, how can I you know, get rid of it, or, or at least calculate? And then this led to the next question is, can we use these scattered photons in some way in diagnostic imaging, and if so, how? And at the time that I was doing or asking these questions, which goes back over a decade now, um, we were seeing a transition or some research that was taking uh, normal mammography, uh, which was an area of some interest in my time, normal uh, mammography where you compress the breast between two plates and take a projection image of the breast, and we were seeing research into using CT-type techniques to generate a similar image. As you can see from, from this paper uh, from Rochester, the image, the CT image, is in fact much better than that of the traditional demographic image because it removes a lot of what we call the structural noise, which is the noise associated with this projection image that we have here. And the downside, of course, to this is that it's also very sensitive to scattering. And so we, we are struggling with this problem. We'd like to go towards CT for the breast, uh, but we want to get the dose down. We want to eliminate the, the scattered photons. How do we go about doing that? So that's just one area that led me into this work. But in general, radiation dose and scatter is a problem in breast imaging. It's a problem in pediatric imaging, again, where we're interested in uh, keeping our dose low. And it's a problem in radiotherapy imaging, all areas of particular so, why is scatter a problem? Well, firstly, it degrades our image quality and it increases the dose. And what we tend to find is the scatter increases as the distance between the, the patient and the detector decreases. And so, again, this is why we have major problems with uh, uh, mammography, where we typically have the breast quite close to the detector. In pediatric cases as well, where you have a much smaller uh, body that you're dealing with, uh, and in some of these cases, we see the scatter the primary ratio, this is the ratio between those scattered photons and those that are not scattered, approaches about 100%. It also becomes a problem as the patient gets bigger. So not only do we have problems with small patients, we have detectors close to these patients, we have problems with obese patients as well, where the amount of scatter that we're producing increases as we have more material. Uh, and so that causes a problem. And at the end of the day, what does it do? Well, it reduces our image contrast, which is to us getting good diagnostic information. Uh, it introduces a number of different artifacts in our reconstructed images. And these artifacts can uh, obscure and sometimes uh, lead the radiologist astray when they're trying to do a, a diagnosis. And generally, because many CT or computed tomography approaches, whether this be PET or X-ray based CT, um, because these procedures are typically high dose, uh, and scatter contributes to that dose, we would like to find a way of making good use of it. So, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, I want something that doesn't just remove the scatter, which is what is the standard technique at the moment. I want something that actually makes good use of it. Because removing the scatter certainly does help with image quality to a degree, and we can do that through a variety of different mechanisms. We can you know, provide a bigger air gap if that's possible. We scatter grids like we do in traditional x-ray. Uh, we can do empirical measurements and try to use those empirical measurements to correct for the scattered photons. 
or a variety of theoretical or Monte Carlo techniques. All of these can be done, but at the end of the day, take the work, takes that information, and attempts to remove those, those scattered photons from our data set, which effectively means they don't carry any value for us. They're contributing to dose, but they're not contributing to an improvement in the energy quality. Yes, they're preventing it from getting worse, but it's not actually improving the energy quality. There's one more thing that we have to think about when it comes to CT, and that is that traditional CT doesn't actually fully quantify the material. For those of you who remember your, your physics, you will remember that the linear attenuation coefficient of photons interacting with the material is a function of three parameters. It's a function of the atomic number, but importantly, it's also a function of the electron density as well as the energy of the photon coming in. And this is the challenge because tissues change with electron density. And so the mu value, which we get, is a function of the atomic number, which for much tissue, most tissues is relatively similar except for bone and, and, and air, which is what, why we see the good contrast in, in X-ray work, because we're seeing the high atomic numbers of bone relative to that of tissue, that of, that of that air. But we have this electron density which confounds the problem. And so for a particular energy of, of X-rays, we may in fact have electron, two different electron densities, which means we have two different new values, which means we have two different Hounsfield values potentially showing up in our system. So how did we get around this with our earlier work when we looked at CT? Well, the first step was very simple. The first step was to say, let us assume that we can have a ring of detectors around our patient, and we can have an X-ray source here which passes through the patient, and it will interact with the material here in the patient. And some of those photons will go straight through and will be detected here. And this will be our conventional signal that we would use for CT. And we would do this by rotating our X-ray tube around the patient and translating it across the patient. That would be a classical first-generation CT approach. However, in addition to that, you're getting all of these scattered photons as well, which will be detected by this ring. And so in addition to the, the standard data that we're getting, if we collect this data, we can also generate the sinogram. The sinogram is the, the basis for the reconstruction of many of these CT type images. And so what we did in this particular model is we collected all of these scattered photons uh, and we used them to reconstruct an image. Now the exciting thing about using scatter is that I actually get much more data than I do with the conventional projection. I not only get the, the the photon that's coming straight through, but I get every other angle. And that's going to give me a series of sinograms, which I have shown here. So we get this primary sinogram, as well as a series of scatter sinograms, one for every single projection angle around the patient. And this can be used to calculate your standard filter back projection approach, um, which takes the sinogram and reconstructs it to give us, hopefully, the original image. Um, however, in practice, and what I'm showing up here, and this is where we are, we're aiming at, is that the, the actual material that we have here has two different materials. It has two materials that have the same linear attenuation coefficient, the same mu value, but have two different electron density values. They're slightly different. And in the, the standard traditional X-ray projection image, you don't see that, because all you're seeing is the mu value, because you have these two confounding atomic number and electron density parameters of the material which are playing off against the program. And so this approach really took this filtered back projection approach that allowed us to come up with an estimate of the electron density. And then using the scattered sinograms, uh, we would do a correction for these because we need to correct the attenuation of that. And we would uh, sum all of these things together to give us an overall scattered projection that was, attenuation, that was corrected for attenuation. And then we would use a similar filter back projection approach to give us a reconstruction which was now more accurate than the original. This was great. We were very excited about this and we tested it not only on simple phantoms like this, but on more breast-like structures like this, where we had you know, an appended breast filled with a number of different materials. Uh, we looked at a spectrum of energies, because this is an X-ray tube, it doesn't just generate a single X-ray energy, it has a whole spectrum 
of energies, and we use that uh, to look at what we could get. And this is for that simple fact of showing the uh, what you want to view, the, the attenuation one, and what we could get with two different approaches that we took using uh, scatter. One, the, the standard one, and another one which actually used multiple scatter events, which was even more surprising for us. Because every reviewer that we sent our papers to came back and said, oh, this is great, you're dealing with single scatter events, you're crazy, go away, there's lots of multiple scattering involved, it's not going to work. But it does work. And it works, it is a little surprising that it works, but it works because there's a strong correlation between the multiple scattering events and the single scattering events, which allows us not only to get good images, but in fact a better image, because we're now using more photons, and those multiple scatter events are slightly blurred, so it actually starts to blur us on a smooth out my image. As far as that breast image is concerned, again, I'm able to reconstruct with relatively good accuracy uh, those different materials, and I'm sorry, the image is not great, but when I look at a, a more realistic uh, image shown here of uh, the breast structure, with as opposed to fatty tissue, glandular tissue, and some that's sort of 50-50, I get an image that reconstructs these materials with an inaccuracy of about 1%. Sounds great. Why are we making it and selling it? Well, the biggest problem is, is my first, uh, the very first slide that I showed you in the system, I said I used a pencil key first generation CT system where I scan a, a, a thin narrow beam of X-ray photons across my patient and I collect the data in a ring-like structure. It's very time consuming uh, and it's not really practical to collect data like that clinically. So the next step we went to was to look at a spectroscopic approach where we now start to say, well, hang on, instead of just collecting these scanned photons, why don't we look at their energies? Because their energies carry information. And so this approach allowed us to move away from a scanning pencil beam into one that theoretically could be a cone beam type system, which I've already mentioned the problem with cone beam CT, which is of interest to me, um, where we would have a source of x-rays here, and we would have our standard flat panel detector here behind the object, in this case a breast. But I'd also be looking at the scattering into planes, laterally, and even underneath this breast, and collecting data there. And I'm, as I said, I'm not just collecting where the photons go, but I'm also collecting the energy of those photons. And so, so from a mathematical perspective, what I have in a simplistic form, I have a source of radiation here, I have an object over here, I have a series of detectors placed not behind my object, but to the side of it. And if the photons come into this region here, they're going to scatter through some angle. Uh, and they're going to reach this detector. And I, can, I can describe the number of photons that get to this detector using an equation that looks something like this. And the key aspect of this equation is this uh, Planck-Schiene differential cross-section. Scattering, it tells me what the probability of scattering is into a certain angle uh, at a particular energy. And so I can then go off and calculate this for every single point in my, in my body. That's not really what I want to do. I want to get the reverse. But key to this, of course, is that the electron density plays a linear and important role in the number of scattered photons that I'm going to detect in any of these detectors. So I can turn this equation a little bit on its head and, and rather look at how I go about reconstructing an image to get the electron density. And this is based on work that was originally done back in the 19th by by Norton. Um, so we take the premise, or the principle, that Every single scattered photon uh, in an inscribed uh, angle of the circle is going to scatter with the same, same energy. So, because it's the same angle, but there's a direct correlation between the scattering angle and the energy of the scattered photon. And so, using that relationship, I can come back and get the electron density uh, using this, this approach, uh, which allows me to, interestingly enough, calculate an image with only one projection. Now, that's exciting. Because most CT, you need to rotate the gantry around the, the patient. Now, you may look at this image and say, well, if you think this is a good reconstruction, think again. And, and, and you're right, it's not a great reconstruction. Um, however, if I was to limit this and, and, and push, like push this into the limits of a, you know, an energy resolution that was extremely accurate and a spatial resolution that was extremely small, this image actually gets pretty good. 
but at the end of the day, this is a lot better than what you would see with a standard CT from a signal projection. You get nothing. You won't see anything from a signal projection. And so we're off to a good start here. And what this is collecting is effectively just collecting what we call a C sinogram, slightly different than the regular sinogram. But all it reflects is it reflects each of these detected positions and the energies of the photons that are being detected by each of those and the intensities, the number of those. So that gives you this uh, sinusoidal S-shaped curve here. Um, and using that data alone, I can go and reconstruct this image. So of course, if I'm using this as part of a regular CT, I don't only have one projection. I have numerous projections. And so I can collect the data from every one of these projections and, and calculate uh, this sort of image from my scattered photons alone. Now again, you may say, well, hang on, this is not that, that great an image. I've seen much better CT images than this one. Yes, but you haven't seen a better image created from scattered photons. And what we're suggesting is not that you would use this image on its own, but this, that this image would be combined with the projection CT data to give you a little more better quality image of the current data. Now, interestingly, we've been able to show a couple of things as part of this from the scientific perspective of Charles Dalquet. The question, well, how does the resolution depend on things like the number of projections that we look at? And what we found out is the modulation transfer function, which defines my spatial resolution of my system, is independent of the number of projections. This really tells me that, yes, that image that I got from one projection isn't very good, but actually the spatial resolution doesn't, doesn't, come, in, doesn't come from, from that single projection. Uh, what it does come from is it comes from the energy resolution that my detectors have and their spatial resolution. And this series of curves to show that as I make the energy resolutions uh, sort of smaller, sorry, and the size of the spatial resolution of the detector is smaller, so my MTF moves out here. And the ideal one, of course, is just a, a flat one overall frequencies. And as, I, as my energy resolution gets worse, my spatial resolution gets worse, so my MTF drops off, my spatial resolution gets worse. On the other hand, if I look at uh, my contrast to noise ratio, I can show that my contrast to noise ratio is strongly dependent on the number of projections that I have and the number of photons that I'm using. Again, to some degree the number of photons is obvious as I increase the number of photons. This is a quantum process and so I'm going to have quantum noise involved. And as I increase the number of photons, my noise is expected to go down. Um, what we weren't quite sure of is how the number of projections factor into this. And so we have a, a table here which shows that we have a large number of projections and a high number of photons, we get a pretty good a contrast to noise ratio versus a true down this side. And when you analyze that data, it's interesting to find that the, the contrast to noise ratio at the end of the day is a function of the square root of MP where M is the fluence, P is the number of projections. So there's a direct trade-off here between the number of projections that we collect and the the, the number of uh, photons that we have. And so I can get the same contrast for a low-dose system by increasing the number of projections, which is really, again, quite an exciting outcome because in many cases, we're trying to find ways of reducing the dose from CT. And so if, if this is an easy way of doing that, we can still make use of those photons while keeping the uh, dose down. So, that's sort of the theoretical simulation work that we've done, and we're continuing on with this work in an experimental benchmark system to try to test and evaluate a number of these ideas. But this has also led us to looking at other modalities uh, where scatter is a problem, and that's particularly positron emission tomography. It's an important functional imaging modality, which we use for oncology imaging, monitoring of therapies, uh, you know, for assessing of tumors. So from a medical physics perspective, particularly from a radiation oncology perspective, uh, positron emission tomography is an exciting modality. Um, you know, we can see on this side we have the CT image, on this side we have the PET image, uh, where it's showing bright in regions of the tumor, and while that may have been obvious from the CT image, the CT image here doesn't show necessarily that there was nodal involvement, uh, whereas the PET image shows very clearly that the nodes are highly involved. So how does PET work? Well, 
this, you're going to probably have a general sense of it, but I will summarize it briefly. We start off with a, a radio tracer, which is radioactive, it's unstable. Typically, for PET, we're using tracers that have too many protons. Uh, they decay, giving off a, a positron, a beta plus particle, a happy particle, an electron. Uh, that positron loses energy through a variety of interactions until it meets up with another electron. Uh, they annihilate, giving off two 511 KeV gamma photons, roughly 180 degrees to one another. We detect those two. Oh, we detect those two photons. Uh, Anti-parallel photons, and we use this to help reconstruct our image in a very similar way to the way we would have done with CT. Otherwise, we can create a sinogram. We can do a sort of back projection approach. And everything is, it is great. Um, and so, you know, using something like this, you would be able to generate you know, great functional images of this nature. However, there are two problems with, with PET. The one is that we have photon attenuation taking place. And remember, we don't have any idea of what the anatomy is. All we know is what the uptake of the radio tracer is. That's not an anatomical image. That doesn't tell me anything about the anatomy. And yet I somehow have to find a way of getting a correction for the photons that are being produced in the system. And that makes PET somewhat more challenging than CT. In CT, I know the source. In PET, I don't know the source and I don't know the anatomy. Uh, the other thing that's a problem is our friend scatter. And these two things also get tied together, of course, because scatter is just one of the interaction processes that takes place. And in fact, at this energy, soft tissue, it's the most important uh, interaction process that takes place. So these are, to some degree, the opposite sides of the same coin. On the one hand, my photons are attenuating, and every time they interact, they're producing a scattered photon. And so the challenge is, when I produce a scattered photon of this nature, I then cause a detection in coincidence between here and here, and my system's going to think that this annihilation position, which was here, lay somewhere along this one, and that's not true. And so again, you can see that the effects of scatter are going to cause problems with my reconstruction. Now, incoherent or complex scattering is again pretty straightforward. As I mentioned earlier, there's a direct relationship between the scattered photon energy uh, from here and the angle of scattering, which for us is, is very valuable. And it allows us then to uh, look at our system in such a way that we are able to take our measured photons here, and provided we know the energy of those photons, we'll be able to know what their scattering angle is. And so that's going to allow us, and I'll show in a moment, a slide where what this will allow me to do is to draw a curve, a circular arc, and I'm going to give a particular angle, sort of uh, radius, and I'm going to be able to say for a particular energy photon I detect here, my light annihilation position is going to lie somewhere within those arcs. I'll show you that in a minute. Before I do that, just to reinforce the fact that this is what we see in our detectors with PET. We'll see a peak, a so-called photo peak, where we are detecting most of those unscattered photons. But there's also going to be, and I'm sorry, that's this, this, this line here, this is the total. We also have quite a significant number of first order scattered photons, those that have been scattered once, and even some that have been scattered twice. And so these are our first order scattered photons, which may have a good fraction of this. These get even higher, as I mentioned earlier, when we go to 3D PET, where we can see scattering from a number of different directions. And then there's a smaller fraction of, of second order scattered photons. So, what are we trying to do? Well, we want to try to prevent the degradation of our image from using complex scattering. Uh, we get about 10 to 20 percent of scattered photons in 2D. This goes up to about 60% in the 3D systems, and we have large patients, so it's a significant contribution. Uh, the content scattering degrades which you can't cross the quantitative, uh, quantitative accuracy, so it becomes difficult to quantify the uptake that we're trying to do. And again, much like CT scatter, various correction approaches have been tried, but at the end of the day, all they do is they try to subtract that scatter from the measured data. And that doesn't help us, it doesn't contribute. And hopefully you, you've already got a sense that some form of anatomical imaging would also be helpful 
it will be helpful to allow us to correct for the attenuation, and it will be helpful uh, to allow us to get a sense of where the uptake is from an anatomical position. Right? Normally, if I just see an image like this, it's difficult for me to judge exactly where this uptake is occurring. And so if I can overlay that with an anatomical image, that will help. Now, that's done today using CT and MR. In many cases, you will actually have a MR attached to the head system or a CT attached to the head system. Uh, again, great image quality combined together at, a, at an extremely high cost. So if one's looking at trying to find a mechanism of getting lower cost systems out of the community, uh, if I can get away from having two systems, that's certainly going to be helpful. So overall, the objective of this research really was to improve the, uh, the head system by improving image quality and to try to find a way of providing anatomical information. I mentioned that the principal photon energy was 511 keV or 511 MeV, that most of the photons undergo single scattering events, about 80% of them do that, so can start off by making the assumption that this that we have only single scatter. It's not quite true, but it's a good starting point. And at the end of the day, the scattering angle is related to the scatter photon energy by, by this relationship. How do we go about reconstructing head images? Well, as I said, we can use our standard filtered back projection approach. But in practice, we're using that less and less these days because computer systems are becoming more powerful. And because PET is by, by its very nature a noisy system, we have fewer photon counts than we do with CT, we're looking at other approaches which are able to handle noise uh, somewhat better than filter back projection. So we, we typically look at iterative approaches, uh, and the most common one is what's called the maximum likelihood of expectation maximization. And we're not going to go into any details as to how this actually occurs, except to say, here we're talking about MLEM, this is what I mean. Uh, and we use various mechanisms of this, and typically most of our work has been done using this mode, MLEM, where instead of creating a sinogram, working from that, we really just start from the long list of all the photon interactions that have actually occurred, and we recreate our, our image using that. And in some cases, although I'm not going to talk about it today, uh, when we went to 3D reconstruction, where we have a lot more data to deal with, we also looked at using one pass of this mode models, otherwise our reconstruction is but in general, what we're doing is we're taking our CT data, we're turning it into a sinogram, and then we're using some mechanism to take this data information and turn it back into, into this. And those of you who may remember some of your mathematics uh, will realize that there's a, there's a relationship between this sinogram and this image through the Raynaud transfer. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to do both CT reconstruction processes. So what happens with photon scatter? Well, again, this is that image that I, I showed you a little earlier, just in a slightly different format. Here I have my annihilation. I have my two coincident photons going in different directions. One of them scatters. It's detected by this detector here. Um, and in a normal heck reconstruction algorithm, you would mistakenly think that the annihilation lay somewhere along this line. However, we're clever because we can measure the energy. And we can say, OK, because this has a different energy from the 0.511 that we're expecting, we now know it had to have scattered through a certain angle. And so, using that knowledge, I can come up and I can say, okay, what is that angle? And I can define these two circular arcs, uh, which give me this uh, range. And I can go and reconstruct the probability that the photon gets to these detectors from this point by scattering using an equation that looks relatively complex here, but is really made up of a number of very simple blocks. The first one is the electron density at the scattering point here, which is important, directly related to the number of scattered photons. The Kleinishian cross-section, which tells you the probability of scattering from a certain angle. The attenuation component, both of the primary photons before they scatter, as well as that after they scatter, uh, so they have different new values. Uh, and there's some relationships with the detection efficiencies of detectors and some geometric terms which come into this. And of course there's the number of photons that are being produced uh, at, at this point. And so all of those can be brought together to give me a number. And I can then go ahead and I can 
reconstruct the activity distribution by using, if I wanted to, a projection high projection approach um, within those two circular arcs, within the, the area. And I can also calculate the electron density map by not looking at the area within the two circular arcs, but rather doing this projection back projection along the arcs. And so with one set of data, I'm able to actually gather two valuable bits of information, both the functional information, the activity, um, and the electron density, giving the, the anatomical map of what's going on. Finally, uh, I can now use that. Um, oh, sorry, not finally, but one of the challenges with these arcs is they can be quite large. And it's important to try to constrain the areas as best we can. And there are a number of different techniques that we can do to do, use to do that. The one is simply to start to use the patient's outline or the outline of his uh, anatomy to help constrain. And like, the area in red is just a constrained area. In fact, it can show mathematically that this annihilation can't lie outside of that red area if it's to meet all the constraints of both the patient anatomy as well as the energy of these detectors. And so that allows me to improve on my reconstruction. Um, I can, you may ask, well, how do I go about getting this? Well, I can get it from that uh, CT or MR image that I take. Uh, I can also recreate it by an iterative approach where I start off by, by calculating something and then slowly improve on the, the, the volume that I'm reconstructing. Or sometimes maybe just a very simple ellipse or a circle that would represent this patient very crudely will help me improve matters considerably. So there are a number of ways to do it. Um, the gate simulation platform that we use stands for the Giant Application Provision Tomography. It's a Monte Carlo simulation code, uh, which is based on Giant 4 libraries. And this is really the standard for pet simulation. And this becomes our gold standard for data generation uh, when we don't have access to, to actual uh, measured data. So much of the work I'll show uh, is based on gate. We also use a number of different phantoms to, to represent our patient and try to extract data, ranging from small animal imaging system uh, simulations, which are great because it allows us to suppress the effects of, of photon attenuation. We're dealing with a very small object. There's not much material to attenuate these 511 AV photons. Um, or a much larger clinical system, which is more suited for human imaging, uh, and which we have to worry about both attenuation and, and scattering. Uh, and the phantoms would look like something like this, which is a very simple circle with a couple of objects placed in it, something that looks a little bit more uh, humanoid in style, um, again, different objects placed in it that we're trying to reconstruct, or some of these standard phantoms which are put out by uh, NEMA, uh, which we'll use for comparing with, with measured data. And this is just pictorial views of those, uh, and this is just some sort of cross sections to the some sense. Finally, um, as far as how do we go about measuring our image quality, there are a number of terms that I, I will use. Uh, I will typically talk about the contrast recovery coefficient, uh, which is calculated using these equations. Don't worry about them, but they're slightly different between what we call hot spheres and cold spheres. Hot spheres being regions where there's high levels of activity, uh, much greater than the background radiation. Cold spheres being exactly the opposite, where there's less uh, activity than the background radiation. I'll talk about the relative standard deviation, which is the measure of noise, and in some cases, the, the relative accuracy of the measurements of phantoms. So let me show you what, what you would get. Let's take one of those phantoms, and this is the image that we could reconstruct using 3 times 10 to the 5 true photon coincidences. So these are true. This is what a conventional head image would do with those photons. If you took the scattered photons, a bunch of scattered photons, same number, and you plug these scattered photons into the conventional method, this is what you get. Absolutely nothing, just a bunch of noise. If you take the same scattered photons, you plug them into our scattered MLEM algorithm, what we call a generalized scattered MLEM algorithm, which tries to take into account these arcs as, as an indicator of where the photons annihilate, you'll get an image that looks something like this. Again, you're saying, well, this is not as good as this image. I would agree. At the end of the day, we're not suggesting that this is the image that you would use. 
But at the moment, what you're trying to do is you're trying to take both trues and scattered photons combined, and you're trying to extract this image from it. And what we are suggesting is that it's a lot easier to combine this image with this one and get a good quality image than it is to combine this one with this one. Because this, in fact, enhances the image results. And these uh, results tend to show that. And what we have in this figure is just a trade-off between the noise, the relative standard deviation on this axis versus the contrast recovery coefficient on this axis for a variety of different conditions. The standard one would be, if I would have a perfect system with uh, just true photons, I would have this black line here. As I add scatter with the conventional uh, algorithms, it tends to make things worse. So what we see is we see a reduction in the contrast recovery versus the noise. Uh, and ideally, we'd like to be up here. We would like to have no noise and maximum contrast to cover. And so anything that gets closer to this top left-hand corner is better. And so adding noise to our system, sorry, adding scatter photons to our system makes it worse than the regular algorithms. Using our standard algorithm without using any patient constraints improves it slightly. As we add patient constraint further, it pushes this above what you would get with the true algorithm. Showing that the fact that noise is being used to improve the image quality, not make it worse. Um, and the same is true if I look at uh, um, coal sources, on similar but slightly like different trade-off again, we see an even better result for coal sources, where as we add uh, noise, so we get a better result. And, and these black lines are sort of showing the optimal position of uh, that we stop at to get the best image quality possible uh, for a particular scenario. So we're making things better, not worse. We can take steps a little further and try to constrain areas. Whereas we've started with these two circular arcs, we haven't really looked at what the probability is of where the annihilation is most likely to take place, given the detection of photons at A and B. We don't really know perfectly, maybe, but there's a greater probability that photons detect it particular energy detected the two detectors coming from scattered photons are going to be produced somewhere in that, in that area. And what we can do when we look at this different arrangements, and this is just very simple arrangements, where I have a, a cylinder uh, and I have a single source represented the patient, I have a single source here, uh, initially sort of just offset from the center, moving further away from the center, the probability distribution changes, but there's a pattern very clear pattern to it. And the same is true if I go to uh, a different distribution where again I just increase the size of the patient vacuum. This is the uh, radioactive material distributed evenly throughout this whole region. Again, there's a very clear pattern to this uh, distribution, which I go back to the slide, I shouldn't do the show here, and this pattern can be described mathematically. And this mathematical pattern, um, if I look very carefully at it, uh, you know, it has some relationships between the slope uh, and the width of that distribution. So there's a slope of this line here, there's a certain width of this distribution here. And this relationship is strongly tied back to the phantom radius. And if we use this on one of our NEMA phantoms, this is the distribution that you obtain from our simulations. The red lines are the distribution that we obtain from the mathematical model. And so again, this can be used to help improve the quality of the image. And this is showing what we would get out using this probability map, a somewhat blurred image. Uh, when we introduce that probability map, again, we get a much better result. Uh, this is showing a profile through this object, uh, showing a much better ability to track the changes in the activity as we go through that material. The other question that quite often gets asked is, well, what happens when your energy resolution changes? Uh, and again, this is just a plot showing that when we have very good energy resolution, much better than we can actually obtain currently experimentally, uh, about 1%, we get a very good result. When our energy resolution goes down to 12%, it becomes relatively poor. Um, we are sort of, we have some you know, problems above about 4%, below, below that, get reasonably good results. And, and the real challenge is how we can improve on the image, the, the energy resolution of our, of our current systems. Um, and this is showing now what we get when we have a 
mixture of 50% scattered photons, 50% true photons. Again, relatively good uh, image uh, you know, resolution quality is down here at 1% level, but even above at the 4% level, the image reconstruction is not bad. And analytically, we can show that here, where I show that anything above about 4%, these are the red ones 0.1%, the green is 4%, the blue is 8%, the purple is 12%. The dotted line here is the conventional reconstruction method. So anything that lies above that is actually an improvement uh, in the situation. Uh, this dashed line is true, so we don't really have that. We always have some scattered control. Uh, but so you can see the green and the red lines, 0.1%, uh, 4% clearly lie above that. At 8%, it's a little doubtful, it's better for hot, some of the hot is worse than some of the cold uh, sources, but generally above 4%, we are improving the image quality. Um, and really that's the message I want to leave. There are a number of things that we, we had to look at in greater detail. We've had to look at things like how do we go about calculating the attenuation. Um, and there's some, some challenging issues that we have to deal with because we're now starting to use scattered photons. The attenuation calculations use mu. Mu attenuation coefficient is calculated by looking at probability that a photon undergoes an interaction um, and scatters into all energies. But if I'm using some of those scattered photons as part of my image reconstruction, can I really say that that photon is attenuated? Because I'm reusing it. So we have to actually adapt and modify the attenuation coefficients so that we can take that into account. So there are a number of other physics-based problems that we need to deal with. At the end of the day, our biggest challenge is how do we go about improving the energy resolution of our PET detectors, which can vary anything you know, in current systems from 8 to 14%. Um, we would like to get them down to 4%. Um, uh, and you know, we're, we're working on that, but we still need lots of bright ideas. So uh, with that, I'd just like to thank you, uh, open the floor for any questions, and just you know, in waiting, just like to acknowledge a number of students, uh, both past and present, who have been involved in this work, uh, as well as the uh, funding from a, a number of different sources. So thank you very much. Have a couple minutes for questions. If anybody has one, right? Maybe. Uh, uh, no, I missed. Uh, what, uh, what did you call hot? What was the difference between hot and cold scatters? Typically, when you give a uh, radioactive source to a to a patient, um, there's there's a background radioactive level that, you know, distributed throughout the patient. So hot sources are typically those that have more activity in the, the average background. Cold sources just simply those that have less activity in the average background. And historically, people have only focused on the hot sources because that's typically what we've been looking for. Um, you know, you're normally looking for an increase in glucose uptake, um, which is sort of uh, indicative of a tumor. But, but sometimes we like to be able to accurately reproduce the cold sources as well. Um, and so it's always important to do both. How well are you doing reproducing the, the active region, but also? No form definitions, more than that. I was kind of curious, actually, um, how computationally intense um, it is to do your reconstruction algorithms. Um, you were talking about a few of them, uh, like the GSMLEM. Um, in your example that I think was using like 10 to the 5 photons, can you run these on conventional computers? Yes. How long do they take? Okay, it can be run on conventional computers. Uh, again, obviously the more powerful the computer, the shorter the time that it takes. Right. We can get into 3D reconstructions at the moment, the MSA algorithms, um, particularly the iterative ones, um, are, you know, can take days to okay. construct it. Which is why when we went to 3D, we started looking at what's called a one-pass system, 
where instead of repeating through the whole sequence of, of photons, you take one set, uh, you optimize that one set, and then you go on to the next set. And so you, you use sort of part of the set to help you improve the next iteration, and not the whole set. Um, and obviously that can help significantly speed up the, the reconstruction. But yes, it can be anything from, you know, hours to days, depending on the number of photons you choose. So anybody who's interested in, in, in looking at uh, head detector uh, systems to try to find ways of improving the, the resolution, uh, I'd love to hear you know, any ideas that you may have because it's a, certainly it's a challenging problem for us right now, um, which we haven't yet entirely resolved. So we're working the right ideas. So, what detectors are you using? Automultipliers? So, well, then traditionally it's photomultipliers and scintillators. Right? Now, more modern systems are tend to use solid state uh, analog photodiodes, uh, which obviously have the most benefits. But they're still based on, on scintillator material measurements. And this is part of the problem. We're trying to look at uh, multi layer scintillators um, to, to try to help improve the energy resolution. Have, you have a trade-off between the uh, sensitivity of the system and the energy resolution. And because we deal with a small number of photon counts, if we drop it, we lose our uh, sensitivity too much, our noise is going to go. So this is really where we, we have a trade -off. Plus, we're looking for relatively small detectors as well. So, you know, from our perspective, all, all these things play all the So it's difficult to find a small detector good sense to the anti energy uh, resolution. Okay, if there are no more questions, um, yeah, let's thank Dr.